In a previous video about the number one crossbar, I mentioned that markers allow us to do some really cool stuff with call setup, and I promised that I'd go into more detail on that. In particular, I'd like to talk about things called route advance and second trials. Both of these capabilities were an important part of what set crossbar apart from earlier systems. It might be a little difficult to appreciate how cool this is from a modern perspective, so before we dive in, let's get some context. And as always, the usual warnings. I'll narrate this video assuming you watched the previous ones in the series. And this video is by no means a complete treatise on alternate routing. It's just an introduction. To start, let's review a little bit about markers. In a way, markers are to a telephone switch what CPUs are to a computer. They're the controlly bits that tell the switch fabric how to do the connecty thing that switches do. You might remember that an originating marker in a number one crossbar has two main jobs. First, it acts like a database of all the routes that a central office has. For instance, a sender can ask the marker for call completion info for the 832 code, and the marker will happily pass that info back along. The storage method used for that database is these cross-connect fields here. Each connection represents a piece of information that the marker can call upon when asked. The marker's second job is to set up the crossbar switches themselves to establish a path to the outgoing trunks located on the office link frames. These outgoing trunks lead to the central office where our call will complete. They can be in the same building or miles away. Now, if we were to take our simple example and make it look just a little bit more like a real number one crossbar, it might look like this. You might have about 100 senders talking to perhaps three markers, which are connecting the calls through the switch fabric. And all of this is happening concurrently. Keep in mind that this is still simplified so that I can show it on the screen easily, but it should get the point across. But there's one more thing that markers do that we really haven't talked about yet. Markers are full of checking circuits, and during each operation, they do all sorts of tests on themselves and on the routes they're about to set up. If any tests indicate a problem, the marker will attempt to go around the problem by doing what's called a route advance. In order to understand why route advance is such a big deal in 1940s era crossbar land, let's go back in time even further to the 1920s and take a look at the panel system. The panel switch has a decoder, which can do some of the things that a marker does, in that it stores information that tells the sender how to complete the call, and it provides that information to the sender on request. But the panel system has a major architectural difference from the crossbar. In the panel system, the decoder is not responsible for setting up the connections through the switching fabric. The sender is. In fact, the decoder has no visibility into the outgoing trunk groups at all. So the decoder tells the sender to use a particular trunk group without knowing its occupancy level. Only after the sender has accepted the information from the decoder and directed a selector rod to move up to the right spot on the district frame, does it find out whether or not there's actually any available trunks in that group. Take a look at this comparison between decoders and markers. Although each serves a similar purpose, the marker has some clear advantages. Let's make some calls to a busy trunk group so we can see how panel and crossbar handle this problem differently. We'll start with a panel switch, and I'll use these busy plugs to make all the trunks to the 722 office appear busy to the sender. As soon as we dial the third digit, the sender asks the decoder for the information it needs to complete this call. The decoder informs the sender that the trunks are located in brush 1, group 4, on the district frame. The sender then guides the selector upwards towards this group of trunks. Once our selector reaches the group, it tests the sleeve lead of the first terminal in the group and finds that it's busy. 
The selector then keeps going upwards, now under its own control, looking for a free terminal. This process is called trunk hunting. If the entire group of trunks is busy, the selector will keep hunting until it reaches the last terminal in the group, known as the overflow terminal. The overflow terminal has its polarity reversed, and when the sender sees the polarity reversal, it understands it to mean that all trunks are busy. The sender then instructs the district selector to give a busy signal to the caller, and that's it. The caller has to hang up and try again, and hope that the next time there will be a trunk available. In sequential hunting systems like the panel switch, the traffic engineers were challenged to make sure that this type of all trunks busy condition happened as rarely as possible. The trunking layouts were engineered in clever ways, by dividing trunk groups up into high usage core groups and common overflow groups and arranging them on the district frame so that there was almost always enough of them to handle the maximum expected volume of calls. This wasn't perfect, however, and a more robust method of handling an all-paths busy condition was needed. The number one crossbar marker was designed to address this problem. Let's see how that works. If we place a call to 832, we expect the number one to outpulse MF to the terminating office as I showed you in the last video. But what I'm going to do here is make all the 832 trunks busy. I'll do that by inserting busy plugs in these jacks. This means 832 calls can't get through by the usual direct route. But that's no problem, because the marker recognizes the all trunks busy condition and performs a route advance to another trunk group that's specifically been set up for this purpose. The trunking layout of the museum is designed so that the number one crossbar's alternate routes are served through the panel office as an intermediate point. Then, at the panel office, there are trunks that happen to come right back here to the crossbar's terminating half, which will allow the call to complete normally. Let's listen to the call. After the sender receives the third digit, calls in the marker. The marker does a lookup against its routing table and determines which trunk group to route the call to. But upon testing this group for idle trunks, it finds there's none available. The marker then looks at its cross connections again and finds that there's an alternate route to reach the desired office, so it sets up a path to these trunks instead. The marker sounds different on a normal call and an all trunks busy route advanced call. Can you hear the difference? Now that the route is set up, the crossbar sender simply drives the panel selector to a known location where trunks exist that connect us to our terminating office. When the selector reaches those trunks, it stops and our call completes through from there. Using this trouble indicator frame, we can ask the marker to display its original and alternate route choices for any office. The routing information is here, and the progress indications are here. This frame will also be called up by the marker if it detects a fault that it can't recover from. When used in that way, the lamps show the marker's state at the exact time of failure, and the problem can be worked out from there. The whole point of alternate routing is to allow the call to complete even if the first choice pathway is unsuccessful. This was a huge win for efficiency, because in earlier systems, you always had to have trunk groups large enough to handle even the most extreme call volumes, when on an average day, many of those trunks would be unused. In crossbar systems, the trunk groups could be slightly under-provisioned, and any overflow calls would simply take an alternate route to reach the desired destination. In fact, you want to have trunk groups be smaller than necessary, because if you're paying to install all of those wires across town, you definitely want to be using as many of them as possible 
in order to get your money's worth. Also, routing overflow calls through an intermediate office makes things more efficient because that group of trunks that you have to the intermediate can then be used to reach any office that it connects to. This means that one group of trunks leaves your office and has the potential to reach any other office in town. This intermediate office is called a tandem, and a tandem is just a telephone switch that connects other switches to switches instead of subscribers to subscribers. In our museum, the panel office is acting as a tandem between the number one and the other machines. Out in the real world, there could be many different kinds of tandems, including panel sender tandem, crossbar tandem, which was just a modified number one crossbar, 4A toll crossbar, five crossbar with tandem trunks, and step tandem. Going into how each of these work would take another few hours, so for now, it's just enough to know that they exist. And of course, in any network, it's advantageous to have multiple paths available between every source and destination. That way, if a path becomes blocked for some reason, the traffic can take another path. Alternate routing is what finally allowed the central office to do this automatically, rather than having the techs and the outside plant folk madly scramble to set this up when a trunk line failed. Another place that alternate routing comes into play is when the term equipment at the far end of a call signals that it spotted a communication error. On MF calls, the senders are designed to recognize an invalid tone combination at the receiving end. When a pulsing failure is detected, the originating sender may receive a telltale signal, which is just a reversal of polarity on the trunk. When the originating side detects this reversal, it understands that a pulsing failure has occurred and that it wasn't possible to communicate correctly with the terminating sender. The originating sender then takes a step backwards and calls in a marker for the second time. And this time, it grounds a particular lead to the marker to tell it that this is a second trial. The marker sees the ground on that lead and automatically advances to one of its second trial routes, which again happens to be through our panel switch. Here's Astrid causing problems in the switch room. The call is the same, except that this time we're using a touchtone phone. Astrid operates a relay in the originating sender that indicates a trouble condition during pulsing, and the sender calls in a marker for the second trial. The marker goes around the problem by rerouting the call through the panel office frame, and then back to the number one to terminate. You're probably wondering what will happen if there's trouble on the second route, too. Well, that actually happened while we were filming this, thanks to some real trouble in the originating sender. I had busied out all of the MF trunks to force the call through the panel switch. When we dialed, the revertive pulses started coming back to us, but a sticky relay in the sender caused the counting process to fail. The signaling went to Telltale, and the crossbar sender recognized this as a failure. The crossbar marker advanced us to the same route, but an alternate trunk, which also failed. After the second failure, we've exhausted our possible alternate routes, and there was nowhere else to go from here. So the sender called in a marker again, and the marker dumped us into the route of last resort which is the crybaby tone. We only hear half of the tone because the oscillator tubes and the crybaby need to be replaced. I promise I'll get around to it soon.
Go ahead and listen to this call, and feel free to pause and rewind the video if you want to focus on a particular area. I was also filming video while this happened. In the video, I was trying to capture a successful call, but as you can tell from my voice at the end, that clearly didn't happen. That was weird. Anyway, that's about all for this video. Next time, we'll talk about the number 5 crossbar, which is quite different from the number 1. Thanks for watching.